Yes, if you can insert under 7A1 the topic we discussed uh, in the past, law enforcement personnel and request thereof. So, so I'll discuss that under my report. Okay. Um, I don't think anyone was signed up, but is there anyone in the audience wishing to address the board? Okay. Moving on. Oh, that's me. Uh, the board chair. In lieu of, <laughs> in lieu of Karen. Um, I would like to discuss the um, policy BEDH public participation in board meetings. Um, you had an exhibit in your packet. I just would like to summarize. We um, certainly encourage public participation at all of our board meetings, but I did want to bring to light that, um, to remind everyone that the purpose of this board meeting is for us to conduct um, the business as charged by law. Um, this is the only time that we're able to conduct businesses when we're together as a board. And so um, certainly we invite people to come and speak um, during the time in the meeting when it's uh, time to address or bring the last piece of the agenda, whatever that's titled, persons desiring to address the board, cleverly titled. Um, and But there are times that we have a lot of business to take care of in a small amount of time. And so the chair at times is able to limit the amount of time provided to each of the speakers ask that um, speakers try not to be redundant if there's a similar theme over and over again. Um, just want to remind people that confidential personnel information or student information cannot be discussed in public. And so I do think very often we, we hear comments from the public and we sit stoically, but that's because we literally are not able to comment or discuss. Um, and I don't know if everyone always understands that. Um, we uh, will not tolerate gossip um, defamatory comments, abusive or vulgar language, and it will be up to the chair to um, kind of shut that down, and they will ask someone to um, stop, uh, stop their comments if that's happening, <coughs> and that is within their right. And so really we just ask, we love to hear from the public, but we just ask for common courtesy and etiquette um, when, that, when they do have something to say. Is that good? Very good. Yeah? Okay, moving on. Uh, personnel. We have nothing under personnel with respect to resignations, nominations, or transfers. So we'll go right to the superintendent's uh, report. If reading essential behavior and outcomes proclamation this evening is Rob. <clears throat> Education enables all students to learn the skills, acquire the knowledge, and develop the attitudes necessary for them to reach their potential as citizens and to meet the challenges of a changing global society. We believe that all citizens in our communities share the responsibility to educate our children and themselves. Our schools are community support systems and should welcome and encourage all members of our communities to participate. And our schools will have a supportive and empowering atmosphere for all students and community members. Thank you, Rob. So now we go to the adjustment, law enforcement personnel and request thereof. And I was just telling Amanda, you talked about a high sense of irony. I learned today that we have been contacted by the um, Maine Catholic Schools and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security School Certification and Student Exchange Visitor Program. The Catholic schools are going through their reaccreditation process. And one of the things that they have to document and prove is that public schools, like Hamden Academy, are indeed a recipient of students coming out of, in our case, All Saints School at Bangor. So Mr. Tracy did write a letter affirming that we've had students in the past, and we have uh, met their requirement uh, to notify them that we do receive those children. So I kind of chuckled at Regan this morning, as I've, as you know, I've said to you in 29 years, 
29 years I've never had this request and all of a sudden, bang, in the last two, three days, I learned that that request has been submitted. So I inform you tonight for the first time in my recall that we have had that request and we did uh, comply to acknowledge that we do receive those children uh, on a uh, application basis here at Hamilton Academy. So that will appear on the agenda every week, okay? Okay, now, uh, ED 279. Well, actually, I'll, I'll skip them, sir. Legislative update. I have chosen four or five to highlight to you, or with you. The first one, uh, the expand the rights of public employees. And also, I'm going to mention in a moment, we met with our town managers today. And I realize that now this bill uh, being uh, advocated for and, and being uh, moved through the legislative process would allow teachers, uh, employees, and public schools to strike. When I read the law uh, finer today, it also includes public employees and municipal employees. So we had a conversation with our town manager today as to how that pertains to them. If you read the summary, it's pretty straightforward in the sense that this would allow and afford people to strike unless they are uh, people in public uh, service in the municipal sector. So we're watching that very carefully as that moves through the legislative session because you may know historically teachers in our profession have never been given the opportunity to strike. Okay, so we'll be watching that with a sense of interest. The next one, which actually excites me, is money being put in to expand or recreate school-based health centers. For you people that haven't been with us for a few years, this is one of my, um, one of my more significant um, failures because we, we started a school-based health center probably about three years ago, and we had some money in East Humane uh, uh, Health Center, and they helped us but we never got it off the ground. And we built the school down in the nurse office uh, with, the with the notion in mind that we would have a health center. And I'm hoping that sometime in the near future, two or three years, that we can bring that back uh, because they had uh, some great opportunities for that uh, to flourish in RSU 22. The next one is uh, making up schools the additional days. And I'll make two points, one here and later in the calendar. Uh, let's first of all look at this year. We have missed five days. The issue is this. By law, seniors must go to school 170 days. Right now, we're at 169. So the administrative team met yesterday, and we're looking at some options. And next Tuesday, we're going to make our decision. And here are the options, and not in any particular order. Number one, you go to school on a Saturday. Number two, you go to school on one of the days in April vacation. Number three, you add one hour per day in five days and then you recoup the five, then you recoup the one day. I would say right now, with no certainty, we're probably focused on the one hour per day, but we will make that decision next week and that will adjust our calendar. That's with the notion that we miss no other days. If we miss another day, then we'll have to come back and rekindle that and rethink that process to make sure that we're in compliance with the law with respect to 170. The other thing that would do, if you followed your calendar so far, I know some of you are planning vacation. As it stands right now, the last student day is Monday the 17th of June. If we make that day up with the one hour a day, then that brings the last student day back to Friday and not to Monday. Okay, everyone with me on that? So we have missed five days, which is pretty normal for us. We have missed three, four, or five days, four or five most of the time, and that's where we are. So we'll talk about that in a moment as well. So that's the, the notion there about making up days. The next one, uh, if you've been following the news with respect to <coughs> Skowhegan, uh, they've been talking, their board's been discussing this for years, and that is the Native American mascot in all public schools will not be permissible. So we'll follow that one. And then restricting cell phones by students while in school as well. So those are the three or four that I've chosen, and I know Scott and Representative and Legislative uh, Hagen are very much in tune with these bills. Any question on anything else that you may be aware of that's happening in the legislature that you read in the newspaper or whatever? What happened uh, uh, was it Camden, Rockport? They were going to do yes. that. Mm -hmm. um, they were going to do their makeup yes. days and it was going to be tried by the Board of yes. Education. Have we heard anything? Yes, we have, Matt. But we just received their memo, I think, yesterday. Yeah. They have approved that. They did approve Yes, it. they did approve that. Yeah. Yes, it was. Shared, it was yeah. a digital days. Yes, yes. that's yeah. correct. Yeah. That's correct. What about the retirement class? Good point. The, yeah, the retire what Jane's bringing up is the retirement monies um, up until about three years ago was all paid by the state, three or four years ago. And then they shifted those retirement monies over to public schools. And right now we have to pay approximately $575,000 in our budget for retirement purposes. Now they're talking about moving that away from school districts back to the state. And that's gaining some pretty positive momentum, matter of fact. 
The question becomes there, though, like anything else, is as you were talking about, Alan, with another topic tonight, where is the funding going to come from that, and how will the Appropriations Committee respond to that? But that's gaining some momentum to move those monies away from the public school districts back to the city. Mm -hmm. I'll keep you updated on that, Marianne. So has, has the board ever in the past um, approved it, uh, approved and voted on um, actually testifying in favor or against any particular bill? Do we ever take action as a board to support any legislation? I'll start and the board members can chime in. Uh, my recall, that would be very rare. I'm not saying we've never done it, but very rare. What we usually do is we usually navigate that through the uh, October board meeting, uh, statewide board meeting, and the delegate assembly where they'll have resolutions. That's where we weigh in and give our delegate assembly no a nominee uh, power there to act on that. But other than that, I think we've been pretty much uh, a recipient of the law. So some of the people who've been with us for a number of years might want to chime in and add on that. We yeah. stay neutral. Well, and, and honestly, I'd like to see us do that, but it's easy to say until we go around the room and realize that we don't all agree on that. So I think my opinion on that is if we can't agree on it, we should just leave it out of this, this room at least. Okay. I will okay. say, I vote. it was brought to my attention though that um, in that fall board meeting, I know in the past I've been one of the delegates that have gone and, and represented with a vote, but it sounds like we didn't have anyone do that this fall. That's so correct. we should make sure that every year we have That's a good point. That's that. a good point. Now the next one, ED 279, I want to spend about maybe five minutes, and if you want to follow up on these with me individually, we can do that, and also Regan is discussing these at the budget committee. But I wanted you to have some familiarity with basically the most important financial document that we received from the state. Rob is very much in tune with this as well. And it's called the ED 279. And the front page in section A, I'm just going to kind of highlight some key points that, that are embedded in, the, in this funding formula. And the first one is that of pupil count. And the advantage for pupil count is they take the two-year average. So if a district has a declining enrollment, then they can mitigate uh, the loss of money. But it all is on the student enrollment. And you can see our average is 24-11. Then they give you ratios in, uh, in Part B from teachers down to school administration. And if you go to the column that says total EPS for teachers at 146.4, we have actual 144. So we have less than what the formula identifies, and therefore we're uh, have to pick up some of those monies locally. So that's a delineation, and one that always, well not always, one that often comes up in the public is school administration. Notice the formula with the size of our district actually allocates 7.9 school administrators, and we have seven. So that basically gives you the demographics, basically on teachers, guidance, and so on. Then you go down to benefits, that gives you calculations there, and then letter D per, cost, per pupil cost, which, respect to substitute teachers, supplies, and so on. All that then brings you down to the total spending, uh, elementary and secondary, you can see is 11 million and 5.6 million. And the key figure in all of this page is the bottom line. And that's the calculated EPS rate per pupil, elementary 67.84, and secondary 7.226. So now if you turn to page B, or letter uh, section two, you can see how those calculations come into play. So for example, in uh, section two, uh, letter A, we have the total of uh, students. You can see, for example, in number two, where you have 92 students in four-year-old pre-K, 15, 36, K through eight, nine through 12, giving you a total of 2368. Then in B, see how the student counts come into play in that column from right to left, the second column, you have 6784. The elementary and 72, 26, <coughs> secondary, and then that gives you the computation as far as the cost you're having. So the pupil count and the EPS rate are two very key factors in the calculation of the subsidy. And then you move to what they call weighted counts in letter C, and that's disadvantaged children. And you can see, for example, four-year-old pre-K, we have 25.8, but notice they reimburse you 115%. That's called a weighted count. Uh, 9 through 12, the same thing. Uh, you have 206, the weighted count, 7,226. The number of students is 224. So basically the theme there is weighted counts. Following up on that, you have targeted funds. Those targeted funds, again, are categories leading with assessment, technology resources, and the calculation there, and then you extrapolate out the total there, which brings you to the um, operating total allocation of 18,364,000. Okay, now go to section three. Now you get into gifting and talent and special education. 
the same type of calculation. And then the inflation adjustment, notice they inflate that. I think, Rob, you mentioned that last night, didn't you, in the budget meeting? They inflated it by a 1.70%. Uh, that was transportation. Transportation was 2%. 2%, yeah. So this, and again, we don't need to get into fine tooth unless you want to come into the office and we can spend four or five hours on this. But this, this will give you at least first blush when someone says to you, how do you get your money? When you take this home and have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or whatever it is, digest this, it'll get, the takeaways are pretty simple in the sense of, of <coughs> understanding the moving parts. Pupil is one of them. Then you go to debt service. This shows you the debt service. Let's pick on Hannon Academy. We paid two million thirty-six thousand for principal and interest of five seventy-seven. Then you give the total debt service. Now remember, debt service is state and uh, local contribution, and that's the as you've heard us say before. To get on the school construction list, you have to be state approved, which obviously Hannon Academy was, and that's where we're trying to get them to grow, whether it be projects in the next eight to ten years. And you have the total combined there of debt service as well. Now you go over to section four. Here it gives basically each individual town, the number of pupils in the town, the percentage of the pupils per town, and then the extrapolation there. The other key uh, notation right here is B, state valuation. Notice the state valuation gives you the average of three years. So here are the two significant moving parts, pupil count and state valuation. And you've heard me say before, where you want to land up an ideal case is your state valuation and your local val valuation are somewhat equal. This year, the state valuation was, what was it really? 3.1? Is it that much? I can't remember what it was. You want? Yeah. Anyway, those are moving parts that are adjusted every, every year, but now they uh, average that out over three years. And then the other thing that happened this year, again, Rob mentioned last night because he studied this, the mill rate. The mill rate went from 8.48 to this year 8.28. That's going to suppress our local commitment this year as compared to last year. And then you get into uh, the memory municipality and the mill rate there, and that totals 19537000 And then Section 5, and I want to highlight Section 5 because we, we reap the benefit here. If you look at number eight, regionalization, because we regionalized, we brought in $152,000 more than if we did not regionalize. And also, that also increases your reimbursement for central office administration as well. So, in summary, I know it's a lot of blabbing, but in summary, pupil count, two-year average. Valuation, three-year average. No rate is set by the state. And you can see on on page, on section five, notice our state share is now 68.37. It's right about the, about, well, slight left from the bottom. That increased by about a percent from last year. So, again, as Rob said last night, 66% of our money comes from the state. So that's an overview of what we call, and you hear Regan and I quite often say, the 279. Well, this is what the 279 looks like. We live by this. The other thing that uh, we need to make sure we are accent I accentuate tonight, the money associated with this bringing in about $750,000 of new state money for us next year has not been enacted by the legislature now. So these are preliminary figures that we're using to formulate our budget, but they have not been secured by legislative action yet. Any questions or comments with that very quick overview, but hopefully some salient parts there for you to integrate at your leisure. And Regan will be talking more about these as we go through the, the budget process as well. Why would they release something that's so preliminary? Yeah. Basically, to give us at least a first blush figure to put in the budget as a placeholder. Um, I'd rather have this not enacted by versus nothing. Believe it or not, I've gone to a budget meeting before in June when we never had this. A couple of years ago, was it? Right. Yeah. Their target is mid-March, we always hear, so this one's only a week ago. Yeah. So again, if you'd like to spend some time with Regan and me, just give us a call. We'd love to have you sit down with us two or three hours or a couple hours and go through it. If you want greater detail and a better understanding, because even with uh, the, the length of my tenure, you really have to slow this down. There's a lot into this, but once you slow it down and look at the moving parts, it all comes together to hopefully make some sense. Okay. All right, uh, let's see, schedule, as indicated before, uh, the Yankees have called me to Florida next week, John, so I'm going down to spring training, so yes, I'll be on the town for eight to 10 days. 
I'll have to put that to John because he just knows that I don't pay attention to the Red Sox. Okay, the town manager's meeting today. Uh, we had a very good meeting. We had representation from each town. We met for about an hour and a half. I gave you the, uh, uh, the partial agenda we talked about. Uh, for the benefit of our, of our audience, we talked about the enrollment, uh, particularly the growth that we've seen of about 11% over 10 years, but also notification to them that our projected enrollment over the next eight years leads us downward to about 200 students. We talked about the strategic plan, the municipal overview assessment. I gave them the list of the assessments over the last 10 years for each town, because remember, we have two new town managers that met each other for the first time today from Winterport and Hamden, and we had representation from Newburg and also uh, Frankfort. Then we talked legislation, and three bills I highlighted was the 40,000 base salary for teachers, then the one that we talked about strike, and that's where I learned that that also pertains to uh, municipal employees, and then back on Jane's question about the retirement costs, and we had a couple others that we talked about. Then Regan went over uh, the presentation that we did last night with the budget committee and gave them documents there. We also highlighted the very important dates coming up with respect to the ratification of our uh, FY20 budget. But it was a very good meeting. And the fundraising report per board, per board policies and closed. You can see that many entities have been busy supporting our uh, initiatives in the school district, uh, just shy of $18,000 over this quarter. I'm sure some of you probably have been involved in some of those entities as well. So thank you very much for people's convictions there. And now we go to Sarah and Lucas. Um, so as probably most of you know, there's the NEASC accreditation uh, this weekend. And the reason, I mean, the reason we're here is because um, as a district, we really value uh, student involvement in the school district, especially when people come uh, to evaluate our schools and to uh, just see what we have to offer. And um, I just wanted to um, let everyone know here, and in case you weren't aware, um, there are some student groups um, that are going to be a part of this weekend, including um, ASB mentoring, which helps with students coming up from the middle schools uh, to Hamden Academy. Um, and it's basically a leadership program that you uh, can join at Hamden Academy, as well as um, National Honor Society is going to be here as well with a um, just to aid the uh, evaluation committee that is going to be here, uh, along with the mentoring uh, people, which kind of overlaps uh, mostly the same people. And um, I am part of a singing group called Chamber Singers, and we're going to be performing for the accreditation committee as well. And um, I think it's really um, important just that students are involved, especially um, when people are coming here, to see what we have to offer. and. Um, yeah, I think that more student involvement, like uh, groups such as, you know, uh, foreign groups and uh, yeah, clubs and stuff like that, uh, can present um, in future uh, occasions. So that's what I have to say for that. <laughs> Lucas, there's one thing a student asked me to mention a couple of days ago, and it had to do with uh, tardies, the tardy policy at Hamden Academy. I believe it's. Um, is it three tardies before a student receives a detention? So, so it's the detention? actually not a, there's no written like you get three and you have a detention. It's after three, we get a notice like, hey, you know, you probably shouldn't have any. So I don't think we actually have a written amount. Three would make you lose an honor study hall, but. Okay, yeah. I, it, that's a better question for Mr. Raymond. <laughs> yeah, like handles most something movement. like that. They said that a lot of students are opting when they get to around that number of tardies to just stay absent for that given day if they know they're going to be, you know, five minutes late. So I've heard of multiple students, okay. you know, taking full absences as opposed to tardies. Just something okay. to think about. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah. Sure. So I, I do want to congratulate Lucas. He informed me tonight he's going to be attending BC next year. I would, I would just like to say that I, I would like to follow up on that concern <coughs> and I'll have the behavioral review committee add that to our policy review. Sure. Okay. Okay, Regan. <coughs> I will project the monthly financials. Of, uh, that is in the folder, I believe.
context for reading the monthly report, um, we are at 65% of the school year um, attended already. And for the fiscal year that runs from July 1st, we're at 68%. So um, by those figures, we should have about 35% remaining in our um, accounts. And uh, when we put that number up against what you're seeing for balances, I think we're doing very, very well. We're right on target in most of the lines. And we have uh, special education, for instance, where we actually are um, ahead of the curve there. And so we've looked into that. And we know that that is because of some staffing differences that have occurred versus what we had budgeted for back in May and June last year. Um, coming down through, uh, regular instructions doing very well, and I'm pleased to report that even though we know we're managing the um, additional amounts through negotiations, it looks like we're going to um, work that right down to the letter, and it seems like it's going to be fine. Um, other instruction, our athletics and co-curricular, we still will have to pay the uh, coaches that are coming um, out of our spring sports and any final winter sports that are being submitted to be paid. In Article 5, student and staff support, um, those are our uh, salaries for things like um, nurses, librarians, guidance counselors, so those are certainly on track. Our professional development that comes out of this article and our um, uh, curriculum office, most of those items have been paid for already except for salaries related to those areas. One thing I want to bring up about Article 5 that we are facing is that we have re reached a shelf life with our technology, um, the student Chromebooks at Hamden Academy. You both probably experienced that. And so we have given out all of the extra Chromebooks we have because we have motherboards failing. And the motherboards to replace them are $189. A new Chromebook is about 280. So we're uh, Nate came to see me on Friday, for instance. We're going to have to make a purchase to get through the end of the year with what we're seeing with some of the, the Chromebooks. So if you can pass on to your um, peers that just treat those Chromebooks with kid gloves for three more months, that'd be great. We'll see how we can get through there. Um, system administration and school administration uh, look like they're right on track as well. Transportation, we do believe that we're going to uh, come out in the end a bit ahead with transportation. So we'll make those adjustments for next year looking ahead. And um, facilities management, um, looks like we're going to be fine. We do have a couple projects that we're now starting to talk about for June because it looks like our balances are going to work out. Uh, we've been monitoring because we have to replace compressors here at HA if anything fails um, with our systems with the geothermal heat pumps. And we're crossing our fingers we will not have to replace another this year. Uh, debt service will pay interest in May. And then school nutrition, we didn't have any funding. Any questions about our progression there? I do have an assistant superintendent report tonight, so I will pass it out. And any extras that come around, um, they can go out to the audience. Actually, I have a question about the nutritional services. Sure. I know we're self-sufficient, but there's a thing I've been hearing on the radio where uh, there's at least one bank that's offering to match um, student meal plan forgiveness. Like if somebody's behind, people are going on their website and pledging, you know, 50 bucks to a student and then the bank's matching that. Have we been approached by any banks locally or any other <coughs> bet or is that like completely hands off? It wouldn't be hands off. Uh, we haven't been approached. Okay. But I will tell you we have had two donations this year from private citizens. Um, one from Hamden situation where there was a staff pool, and so that contribution was made to R22 for the lunch payoff, and then a private citizen in Winterport. But remember, I will be on the lookout for that. A long time ago, Jason Sharp set up something, a cookie fund, because there were there was an opportunity to buy cookies, and he wanted 
you want there to be money somewhere, and I don't know if that ever got continued or if that just dried up. I think that dried up. Tony. Dried that up. doesn't sound familiar to me. Okay. I mean, it's been a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so for my report, I just wanted to let everyone know that, of course, budget development continues so that you have a context around it. We have completed a presentation of Articles 1, 2, 4, 9, 10, and 11 thus far. And uh, I'm pleased to say that those preliminary presentations, though we will make tweaks, certainly, as we move along, they've been quite thorough, and I think we feel quite steady about how we'll move forward and be able to uh, have that be a good representation of what the final ask should be. Um, Article 6 and 7 are next, and that will happen on Tuesday, the 26th of March, and it will be both system administration and school administration that will be presented. Uh, any questions about the way we're moving with budget this year? Just a comment. I'd say that the splitting it up, giving us a little more time has allowed more time for conversation, question, interaction. <coughs> detail mm -hmm. we're not so rushed to right. get things out so that's been nice right it's i mean compares i think from last night rob we're, we're about two months ahead are we not as compared to last year is that right <laughs> that's that quantitative we got the ed 279 two months early too, there, so. there you go there you go uh, one thing i would uh, say is that our attendance at the meetings has been low but we have been monitoring the views of the videos from the budget meetings and those are certainly higher than our attendances but uh, if you know people that are interested um, students if you know people that are interested in hearing about that um, any staff members out there uh, please invite people to come we want to have that level of communication and presentation so uh, building improvements, uh, Mr. Lyons and I went down to the Department of Education and spoke with the Director of Facilities, Scott Brown, last week. And uh, we wanted to hear if there was going to be money in the pipeline for either school construction or for uh, renovations through the SRRF money that is generally for small projects that uh, have different priority levels. Uh, we heard that for our school construction project, we were looking at money that is years away from being present for our SHU 22 because where we are on the list, we have high schools ahead of us and there are a significant number of schools, construction projects that have gone up in labor costs to the degree that the money will be dried up um, before it gets to us. Uh, we also heard there is legislation in the works for $25 million toward SRRF funds, and so we're going to be watching for that, and if that occurs, we will apply as fast as we can to pull down those monies. School maintenance, we had a custodial workshop, and I wanted to let you know this because uh, David Grenier, who's our uh, director of facilities, has done a great job of working with main janitorial and our customer, our custodial teams because we're going to try to have uh, similar products in every building, use the same systems in every building, uh, go ahead and implement cleaning processes that are the same where it's relevant to do so, and uh, try to save money but also increase training productivity. So I can't say enough about our custodial teams. They were here. Um, it was definitely a snowy day that would have been um, a challenge for people to get to but um, they were here and we heard a lot of good things so I think we'll be saving money next year with um, supplies and community relations uh, of course you've heard this before but Kelly O'Brien Weaver was um, honored at the Hall of Flags at the Department of Education so we went down to uh, see her receive that honor and then your link 22 should be in your mailboxes uh, we've gotten that winter edition out and I hope that you find it interesting and if there are articles you'd like to see or things you wish were represented in the link, please be communicative about that because uh, we make it what it is. Thank you, Amanda. Regan, I have a question. Okay. Um, being new, in terms of um, the issue of Chromebooks, what budget um, what article? Article 1. 5. 
Article 5, student staff support, and that's where we have technology. Okay, and when will be when will that be heard? April 9th. April 9th. And one thing I would add to that, we were hearing about student input. Um, yes. Nate Savage has done a nice job. He surveyed the student body about their interests in the technology they use, what functions they needed it to be, what did they like about the Chromebook, what did they wish they had instead. And I think we got a lot of great feedback. I hope that you found that people were committed to filling that out and felt it was worth their time. So Sarah, you had uh, talked to us at a previous uh, board meeting about um, Chromebooks versus another format. So that April 19th meet, April 9th meeting might be a great meeting for students to attend. That, that particular budget meeting to see if indeed, based on the results of the survey, um, whether there is support for switching yeah. from the Chromebook. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's a great idea. To talk to the, definitely my peers and get the word out about that. Right? Amanda, I wanted to, before I turn it over, you go back to Regan's report when we met with Scott Brown. I would encourage Regan and the board to keep an eye open when the next um, phase of applications will be received by the Department of Education. It would be, in my opinion, very likely to be able to write applications within a couple of years. So your position at number 20 right now, if you reapply in a couple of years, maybe with some optimism, you can move up to 15, 12, and 11. That's exactly what we did here. Uh, it took us nine applications to have success with Hamlin Academy. So it's a long road. So just keep an eye on that uh, and making sure that Scott Brown is there um, will be very important as we can develop that relationship to keep an eye open to that. So every time we apply, if we apply with the same <coughs> needs and wants every time, does that do we end up in the same place, or do we apply because we need more the next time? I mean, do we have greater students? What I would do, maybe I'm going to ask Rob to help me because his WBRC works in this, but basically, how do I say this politely? Basically, you want to strive, you want to strive to show greater need every time you apply. Right. So when you apply in 2000, whatever it was, 17, here's our need. Now you need to ramp up the need more aggressively with validation. And, and authority. I mean, but really make the make the readers of those applications in 2022 see there's a greater need than when 2017. So, for example, Keith, let's say if miraculously your, your enrollment increased by 100 kids. That's great. Or what we don't want to see if you have roof problems or foundation, something things like that. So, anytime you can you can ante up the the need of the school, you're going to have a greater opportunity to get um, greater uh, reassurance from the, from the state for approval. Did you want to add to that, Rob? Usually the worst things are the higher you go up in the line. There you go, that's the bottom line. So like New Sweden, their roof came in because of snow. There you go. Mm -hmm. That'll be pumped up. Oh yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> but we did hear an interesting fact that I wasn't aware of. That if you are on the list and you don't get your project funded, if you have to make renovations in the meantime because you have to get by, you are not penalized for doing so and they will hold you at your current place um, and not, yeah. so that was good to yeah. hear. And the other thing that you may decide down the road, you may, is if you don't get on the state list, what do you do, if anything, just locally? Cameron Rockport, back two or three years ago, had a 26 to $28 million school project that they funded locally. There were about seven locally funded school projects within the last five years. There you go. I think people get tired of waiting. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. yeah. The yeah. Thank you, Nana. All right, great. Uh, questions of board members. I I don't know if I should have brought this up earlier, but um, in April we do the uh, nominations and voting for the chair and vice chair. Mm -hmm. uh, you got an email from Karen who said she is willing to throw her hat in the ring for the chair position again. It, we need to vote, so if other people are interested, they can certainly um, step forward as well. I will not, I'm up for re-election in November and I will not be rerunning, so I will be stepping down as vice chair. So we will need someone to at least show an interest or be nominated and voted and agree to it. Um, for the, at Tony's least three right This yeah. is kind of a comfortable spot. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go watch YouTube to see how I look from this angle. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like, I'm a I would, uh, 
I would volunteer for that. Again, it's a voted on, but so we have some interest. Typically, people show interest before someone nominates oh. them. I might get done on time every time. I know. In charge. That's I great. Know. There you go. <laughs> that'll, be my that'll be my plan. That'll be my plan. Are you are you interested in the chair or no, vice chair? <laughs> So think about that. If you are interested or if you have questions, um, I think you could reach out to uh, myself or Karen or Rick. Yeah, particularly if you're interested in the chair, because the, the number one question people have an interest usually is, Rick, tell me how much time is involved in this. So we can discuss that as far as how. Depends on the year. Depends on the year and, and, and the style of your superintendent. Obviously, uh, my style is going to extinguish itself in the years, but we can, we can certainly talk about that if you have an interest to really understand what you're signing up for, if you will, or what you're expressing your interest in. <coughs> yes, I have a question. Um, each month we keep getting these reports, and yeah. the overwhelming theme is vaping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, what are we doing? Yeah. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I guess. Well, the the first thing, thing, cracking down more, and that's why it's popping up. I mean, the kids not learning their lesson. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Glenn Cross and Mr. Tracy to give them this one because Richard, you had a you had a presentation in your school last week. Yeah, we did. And so, so we just wanted to we had, we had a, a group of parents come forward with uh, an interest in learning more. And, and I have to say, in the last two or three years, this has really grown. And and, and uh, to educate myself on the topic because it was so new, I actually visited a vape shop in Bangor you know, and talked to the manager. Like show me what this stuff is all about, and he was very gracious and, and did that, and I learned a lot. But uh, like in our school, we had uh, three incidents this year, and you know, three too many in my opinion. But but uh, you know, it was shocking that it, it just it just started showing up, you know, where where it's so new, and and so there was an interest in the community to learn more about about the problem, and I think a lot of people were were like I was. Uh, a year ago and that they didn't know a lot about it, right? And what these devices were and how they were used and all that. So so we had uh, uh, Brittany Lehman, uh, 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 Dan Stewart come down, uh, and uh, uh, two women, uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa's last name uh, escaped me right at the moment, and, and uh, Roxanne Dubé from uh, uh, Bangor Health. And, and uh, they gave a great presentation, 45 minutes to an hour long, and, and it was very informative. But more importantly, they, they shared a lot of resources, you know, things that you can use to uh, help families and students uh, who, who may be facing addiction issues. They, they, they shared like some curriculum materials that, that you, you could look at, and it, it was very informative. So I think the takeaway for, for uh, us is that we need to do more to keep, uh, uh, to keep the public informed, and, and I think we need to do more uh, as, as around an educational piece uh, in keeping kids informed about the dangers of, of this. So, so that's what I can share about what we had, you know, at the middle school level. Okay. Mr. Tracy, so we've done a variety of things. Um, unfortunately, this year we've had two big events where one was uh, in one setting where eight students were suspended, in another setting where it was five or six. So those kind of really inflate our numbers, but it was a group that kind of. And there might have been one or two devices that were passed around. It's not like each one had one. So there's a lot of curiosity. One thing that um, we try to do is talk to the students and say, why? What, you know, what's the draw? What's going on? What's, you know, why would you do this? Why would you do this at school? And a lot of them are just kind of curious and don't, they're not really thinking about the fact that there are so many other students in the building that are like, I'm really kind of disgusted by that. And I just saw people in there doing this. And that's how we get a lot of our information. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn from the students. We also, um, Sergeant Stewart put something together that showed what the device looked like, what the juice looked like, what the refill cartridges looked like. We sent that out through our school messenger system. Um, we just pur purchased something called Vape Educate. It buys us 25 licenses, and it is a, for our next student that gets caught uh, that we have to deal with, which I hope we don't have any, but it is a five unit educational piece that they have to go through and work through, and it would be something that they would work through with our uh, support staff, but it's one of those things where we're just, it's such a big thing now. Like I think at the end of last year, we had a couple heavy hitters that we kind of found a couple things from, and then it was gone. And then as soon as we got into this year, it seems like it's everywhere. Um, and they're doing it in places where they can't be seen and, and hiding it that way. So it's, it's very frustrating from our standpoint. And I try, to, I try to convey that as I have the conversation with them, like, 
what you're doing in this building is, is, is not okay, you're putting us in a rough spot, it makes it look like we're condoning it because we can't do anything with you in these certain spots. But I really hope the vape educate thing is going to help. We talked about the catch my breath resources. Uh, as, as putting that into our curriculum, Brittany Layman was kind enough to have a wellness meeting and use that as a focus and bring in some of our high school educators as well as our uh, educators across the district and trying to figure out where we put this in the curriculum and where can we put this to better educate students. Sarah or Lucas, would you like to comment on that from a student's perspective? I'd like to add something because I did on that lag when we had, I attended the informational meeting. I think one of the things that I would recommend really driving all to the parents is there's a misconception that the vaping is not harmful and that uh, a lot of the information that we learned is that's, that's not true at all. It's extremely harmful. It's not regulated. And there's so many things in it that nobody knows about. And there's examples where parents are like, they just think it's water vapor or they're letting their yeah. parents are letting their kids do it willingly because they don't realize what it is. Um, and I think that's where there's a big misconception in why you're see, maybe you're seeing it in these kids is because they don't think it's really a big deal when it really is. It's uh, the levels of nicotine are all over the place. It's um, it's not really even when you look at the products, you don't see you don't know how much is in it. So a information campaign which was done at Wagner and some information was sent home. I think that would be really helpful to, to get parents to understand more about what it is because there are examples where parents are knowingly letting their kids do it, which Thank is you. really scary. Sarah, do you want to say something? I think a lot of it does have to do with lack of information. Um, and I don't think if there's, it, it's a really hard situation to tackle because I think you have, uh, for example, uh, packets with information for the students to take because um, is, that, that is the root of the problem. Um, they're not going to take them. Uh, I think that really has to be something maybe that's addressed in health classes, um, possibly in upcoming years, uh, so students can really get a scope of, of, of the real information behind the, the dangers. Is this? Oh, is it, so that program you bought, that's going to be a requirement before they can come back to school? Uh, I think we would bring them back to school, but we would give them a time frame to do it in, so we okay. keep it to the same. So they can learn about what they're putting in, in their lungs. Okay, good. Mr. Rue, did you want to comment on uh, anything relating to Reedsbrook? Well, I haven't dealt with any of the vaping as of yet, mm -hmm. but that I will say that we are going to be um, looking at in our health classes, looking at Catch My Breath. Yeah, we're good. So talking about that. Is, Thank you. It seems to me like by the time the kids get to high school, the educational part of that is gone by. It seems like we should hit those kids by the time they're sixth grade, seventh grade, mm -hmm. before they stop listening, and maybe <laughs> show them that we show show them that it is dangerous, so that they when they do get in that situation, they know it. All right. Yeah. Mary. So we are, um, as Bill said, that we have. Had a conversation and I'm meeting with the health teachers for WC email to make sure that we uh, include some of that in it. And it, it has information for grades 6, 7, 8, and up into high school. And then it also has some PE components at the 3 through 5 level. So we'll just type that in as well. But, so that will be a district wide. I know. These charts are meant to be really more statistical, but do we have a sense of, to uh, Eric's comment, are these watermelon and blueberry, or are we seeing cannabinoid oils and other things being used in the vaping pens? We've yet to see anything other than a nicotine base in anything that we have um, confiscated from a student, but certainly the availability of the other is yeah. like, I know at our dinner table tonight, it'll probably show up on the march, statistics. Um, I'll just say it was probably a, a, an intentionally disruptive uh, activity by a certain person and my daughter uh, clearly stated that it was there were odors that were not watermelon or blueberry. Mm -hmm. um, my concern is that it's it's now being used for other things than, than what is being sold at the local Irving. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in terms of um, last year versus this year in terms of um, <clears throat> suspensions based on substance use. 
Um, we are right now at the same mark we were at the end of last year. So we are definitely seeing more. Mm -hmm. We are tracking this in the Behavioral Absolutely. Review Committee. So. Are we done with that? Uh, yeah, we're still on questions of board members. Okay, so, yeah. so I just have a question. I may have missed this because I, it went kind of fast. On the um, mm -hmm. law enforcement personnel and requests yes. thereof, yes. Um, I didn't catch whether there was any. Well, we had, a, we had a request from various agencies whether the Catholic schools that are going through their accreditation process the question to us was, do you accept students from the All Saints School? And the response was yes. We had no visitation. It was through, it was okay. through correspondence. Is that what you mean? Yeah, we had no visitation. It was correspondence to Mr. Tracy. Mr. Tracy responded. And it was, again, it was a byproduct okay. of the So there was no real, okay. No, no. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in are the number of um, truancies that you actually will send out to um, law enforcement agencies to follow up on? Yes. So yes. just have there been any in the last month? That yes. Matter of fact, I have one tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Okay. I've probably had in the last month, I've probably had six to eight. That's, that's another issue. Yes. Uh, and the other thing that's frustrating is that out of those six to eight, four to five don't show up to have the meeting. And the Sheriff's Department in Waldo County has been a tremendous resource this year. I wish I could remember the gentleman's name, but he's actually had home visitations because I call him and say, Sheriff John or whatever, and he actually goes to the home to seek the parent or guardian down. The other thing that down the road, I'd like to see, uh, maybe Joe can talk to this, I'd like to see a greater oomph um, in the truancy law at the court level too, because right now that's highly ineffective in my opinion. So there's a lot of moving parts there, but we're seeing more truant students. <coughs> we're seeing parent guardians who are, are not involved, mm -hmm. and therefore you have those children become totally disengaged. Uh, so it's kind of similar, not, well, it's not similar to the vaping thing, but there's, there's some pockets there that we need to rectify uh, that we've seen some very uh, concerning points. And just remind me, what at what point does a child become how many days yeah. is Mr. it? Mr. Tracy, remind me. It's, it's ten. Ten, ten. Ten. Ten unexcused days that yeah. is true and student. Out of how? In consecutive no, or ten days. just ten total? Days. Yeah. Ten out days. of the whole year? Or, well, oh, okay. As soon as they hit ten, they become true. Okay. Um, and the, the, I think the way that it works, you have to open the case at that point, and then if they can show that they were somewhere and you have information from them, that closes it. And if they get to ten again, they open another case. It really is a. It's frustrating as. Right. as so the line says, is that you say, okay. there's no teeth behind it for us to do anything except to try to have more meetings and get people to come in. And you say unexcused though, Bill. So what is an excuse if a parent calls and says? So personally, if you look at our policy, it defines what can be excused and what can't be excused. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, if we have a note that says so and so was sick this day, then then we excuse that. Um, but it, you know, we, we've had frank conversations with parents that say they're skipping. I haven't seen them in days, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, what does that mean for graduation ultimately? I mean, if kids miss a certain number of days by law, they have to either prove they've done the work or. Well, Bill, remind the remind the board. There's a number of absences where they don't gain the credit. Remind us on so that. So we have a, a practice or a procedure at HA that says once you've hit, I think it's eight in a semester-long course, uh, you lose credit for that course. Uh, you can yep. go through an appeals process with the principal. Um, if it's a year-long course, and it's uh, twelve, I believe. I could be wrong on that nine or thirteen, but it's right there. Um, but the idea is that usually, anytime I've met with a student at that, I say, okay, next semester, you meet your um, you meet your attendance requirement and we will give you those credits back. That is a huge, huge conversation that we need to have um, in the long run because I don't, I don't know that it is right for us to do that or remove credits if they're passing that class, which is an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, one more. So every month are you um, actually 
sending out truancy letters oh, oh, literally yes. oh, every yes. month. Oh, these yes. letters are going We notify, I, I established the meeting with the parents. Hopefully they'll show up. We hopefully resolve the situation. If they do not show up, then I send the letter to all the county uh, sheriffs or, or pronounce it county court, and then it's in their hands because it's a civil offense yeah. for a parent. Uh, how early in the school year, in this past year, when was the first letter that went out? I'm just curious how quickly this occurs. Mm -hmm. Probably within the first month, yeah. because really? you have students yeah. that they're supposed to come, but they never give us documentation of where they're going, and so we've tracked them eighth grade coming up, or from the year before up, and until we get documentation where they are, we have to, sure. we have to track every day. Right. So it, it can come pretty quick. Wow. It's not uncommon to see early October to answer your question. Wow. Thank you. For the suspension information, what warrants a parent conference? I'm just noticing Wagner, it's with everything. There's a parent conference. It's like a routine for you. Yeah. But with the other two, it does not seem to be a pattern, or maybe it was missed. One is thing, there one thing a scenario that we that try does to do is we try to put a little, put more of the responsibility on the student. So if there are minor things, we have the conversation with the student with the expectation that they need to have that conversation at home. If there are things that there are suspensions, certainly we'll call. Um, but there's if there's a Friday detention, there's a letter sent home. But it just really depends on what it is, whether or not we do that parent conference or whether it's just something. And if the student has an academic detention because they need to work, uh, chances are they stay and do that work and take care of it. So for an in-school suspension, what's the process to inform a parent? We almost never have in-school suspensions. We don't have anyone to staff it. Um, it's so just not it's, an option. what's the process to notify a parent if they're out of school suspension? Uh, we would contact, when the event happens and the student's going to be suspended, we immediately call and get someone on the phone and say, hey, here's what's going on. This is why we're, the student's being suspended. Can you come in and pick them up? Can you, we'll have a conversation. So any suspension is a conversation that way. The other thing, Jessica, to follow up on that, if, if a student is suspended the second time, they meet with the superintendent of schools, okay. they and the parent, parent guardian. And for Reedsbrook, if it's an in-school suspension, um, which I do use, then it's automatically I call home, we talk about it over the phone. If it's something that is a little bit more grievous, um, we'll say substance abuse, I always have the parent in for a meeting. Um, and we, we talk about, here's an outside, outside of school suspension, here's the reason why, how do we get some help for the kid? Um, so, but everything is always followed up with uh, the writing to the parent, and if any kind of suspension at all, I talk personally to them. Can I just ask, in the Wagner, the, the grade was omitted on the student category, could you just maybe highlight, is this upper middle school grades, or is it across the board, all, it's, it's across the board. The grade is not listed on your report. It is not. Not in this. It's, it usually is, but this month it was not. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure why that happened. That, that should be listed on there. Yeah. So it's not a trend. It's just multiple grades. That's, that's correct. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and just a comment on the parent conference. I, I, I just think that's good practice. Of, you know, no, I completely agree. I appreciate that. Yeah. I like that. So I try to do that as much as I can. And, and like Mr. Wu, um, all, all suspensions in school or out of school, are, you know, parents are notified uh, in, in one form or another. Usually by phone call. Um, but sometimes, occasionally, I can't get a hold of someone for whatever reason, so I'll send a letter. Uh, like that sort of thing. Okay, great. Any other questions of board members? I find it interesting that none of the suspended high school students are seniors. They're all younger group there. It's either maturity or senioritis. I'm not sure which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> better at hiding. Yeah. Or, or you beat it into a bill. Either way. Yeah, we're all the hiding space. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. President did not accounted for. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to bring to everyone's attention we do have an executive session that we'd like to get into no later than 9 o'clock. So right. for the rest of the agenda, we would love to get through this in the next hour. So with that being said, committee reports, finance committee. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. Um, so we met um, February 11th. Um, it was a brief meeting, discussed our, our warrant article expenditures. Um, the members of the Finance Committee received a hard copy of the um, district audit. 
Um, it is on the website now, so if anybody is interested in that, and can you may even have some copies if somebody wanted a copy of my card. Um, we talked about um, one of the findings, um, rec reconciliation timelines, and it was just an issue with um, a new accountant um, learning system. It's already been um, fixed, and she's work, working through that already. So it, it was a, maybe an issue at the time, but a non-issue at this point. Um, we talked about what we were looking about, um, what we wanted future meetings to look like, and we decided we didn't want to go forth with having monthly meetings, even though we sometimes don't have a lot to talk about. But it was good to, to take a little bit of time to review. Um, what things were looking like, and keep an eye on that. And uh, um, that's about it. We, did, uh, we discussed, uh, Jim brought up uh, um, talking about paying referees um, through Arbiter Pay. So that might be something we want to talk about in athletic community. Talk about with Fred at some point. That was it. Great. Uh, budget committee. Are there minutes uh, attached to the packet from February? It's approved at uh, yesterday's budget meeting. And uh, as Regan reported earlier, we're moving along, I would say, ahead of schedule. Uh, yesterday's meeting covered Articles 1 and 2, and uh, really nothing nothing to add. I think it's been well uh, discussed previously. Yeah, and well organized. Thank you. Um, athletic Committee. Um, we met uh, 25th of February. Um, we had a multiple agenda meeting, but we really only got to a couple of things. We met with the uh, middle school athletic directors and the middle school administrators and talked about the differences between Wagner and Reedsbrook um, <coughs> as far as athletics go. And uh, they are quite different. Um, they're in different leagues. Um, Wagner is in the PB um, Penobscot Valley League where we play in the Eastern Main League, um, so we played different teams. We talked. One of our one of my concerns was that some of the teams weren't getting as many games as, as maybe Wagner was getting. I mean, uh, Wagner wasn't getting as many games as Reedsbrook, and I had I'd had some um, discussion with parents about that. We talked through that a little bit. And one of the one of the reasons being is there's it's harder to, to get teams in that league. Sometimes they don't have two teams, or sometimes they don't even have a, a full team so it's hard but uh, they were going to work through some of that and see if they could, could work around some of that. Um, it was actually we had a lot of discussion it's quite a bit there I encourage you to read it all um, I'm not going to go through it line by line but um, it was a, it was a really good meeting uh, it ended up we talked a little bit about um, preparing students for high school athletics um, and maybe vertically aligning the Organization so that um, the students were more, the students, the coaches were working on more of a vertical alignment with the high school. Um, so this spring, Fred's going to have a roundtable session with the high school coaches, the middle school coaches, um, try to get them all on the same page. Um, and then we tabled Hall of Fame um, with, uh, and we didn't have much time to talk about the gym. gym or uh, naming rights, um, but we'll be on that um, soon. Uh, one other thing we did talk about um, with the middle school athletic directors was the, the need for um, the uh, athletic trainer at that level. We've had it there before, and they really missed it. He's not having it there this year. So that's something we may think of in the budget process. That's it. Great. Um, building committee. We haven't met since the last board meeting. We'll be on our meeting tomorrow morning. Okay, great. Negotiations, I do not believe has met. <coughs> um, education committee, we met before this um, meeting. There were two major things on the agenda, one being a presentation from uh, Ruth Lyons, who may or may not still be here, uh, about the Gifted and Talented program. Um, she did provide a PowerPoint, which would summarize the presentation. I don't know if it was in our packets or not, but we could probably get that dispersed if you guys are interested in it. We, um, I think one of the big takeaways with that conversation was 
um, our standard to, uh, so gifted and talented is the top 5%. They need to be in the top 5% of the district in order to qualify for gifted and talented. And um, essentially on standardized tests are the assessments that they use to identify in our district because we have such a large group of very talented, high performing students. Um, in order to even meet that top 5%, you're in the 98th percentile of these assessments, um, which is pretty high. Um, it would not be that high in other districts. We had asked just on average, or generally speaking, where would other districts fall in the top five, for the top 5% of their performers? And um, on those assessments, it could be anywhere from about 85 to 92% of the assessments. And we're at 98% on our assessments to meet that threshold. So. A lot of um, smarty pants in our district. Um, the other piece was we uh, heard from three different departments at the high school, science, technology, and um, English. Um, the theme there is they're really trying to expand the um, services offered and uh, meeting the kids where they're at, offering um, courses that are appropriate for the children's and academic path and um, capacity. So they're doing some shifting, jump in, Bill, at any time, but they're doing some shifting in the science department, allowing um, for a, a better match for, um, for science track, not tracking, but for science courses. Um, so we have some accelerated courses and then some more remedial courses for people who perhaps aren't going on to get a biology degree, um, but those kids who are really interested um, in biology or some sciences and would likely go on to um, advanced degrees with that have uh, some more accelerated options. Um, looking in te for technology to add uh, three new courses, robotics um, and engineering courses, uh, which is certainly a student need and interest as well as uh, just a need to prepare our kids for the future. In order to do that, we're shifting some of the resources that are coming available. Um, and so at this point, they don't necessarily need more FTEs or more teacher spots, but it will be um, reallocated. Um, and the last one in the English department, which I thought was the coolest, was um, they're doing a new class, the Stephen King class, right? A whole class on Stephen King books, which is very cool. And of course, they need to reach out to Stephen King, <laughs> I think, to tell them about it. Um, so I think the big, the final question for me in that meeting was, what do they need from us? And Bill's answer was they need flexibility with both endorsement and um, perhaps with some financial flexibility, depending on uh, the enrollment of the kids in these classes. So they will keep us informed as to the interest in these classes. Yeah, did I miss anything? Mary? Yeah. I just have a question in terms of flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, let's say there is an overwhelming response. Um, would a contingency fund, which you talked often about, Rick, be able to absorb any additional um, staff that might be needed to support these programs? Well, first of all, just to clarify, we don't have a contingency fund. I know. We have okay. a contingency theme. Okay. But, but the answer to your question is yes. Matter of fact, we illustrated that this year. We hired a one FTE made up of social studies and ELA this year, Bill, right? Yep. It was not in the budget. So yes, we do that. And we've been, I think we've done a nice job with that in absorbing that in the budget, if you will. Yes. So the question is, is it would it be needed as a contingency item, a, a little extra? Well, we would, we would fund it in that salary line, and hopefully the salary line is going to be able to absorb it. Okay. And the other part of that, too, is that there's another, so many, other, so many other things that go into that with sign-ups, tuition students, numbers of, I mean, we don't, we don't know our total enrollment right. until we get right. much closer. The other thing that often happens, to follow up on your question, Mary, and the other thing that often happens is, particularly in educational land, when we have a child that moves into our district that comes with an IEP, Individual Education Program, and has a one-to-one -one attack, we don't have that in the budget. So we have to absorb that. So the, the contingency theme is embedded throughout the budget, is what I'm saying, but you have to okay. then allocate it in the line you have to expend it from. And that's why, that's why we move monies, at the end of the year, we ask you to move money from here to here, usually to cover the very essence of the question you're asking, usually. So that's already in place? That, pre that procedure's already in place, yes. What I'd like to see for this board two or three years down the road is have a contingency line like we used to have three or four years ago. So why don't we have that? Mm -hmm. in, in a sense, we do. We have an unallocated fund balance that rolls every year. It's basically maxed out at the 3% cap, and if it 
exceeds that, we have to pay it down. Right. So, I mean, we're essentially carrying a rolling 3% based on past spending trends. If we get to the point where we were 15 years ago, where we were nowhere near yes. 3%, we were yes. sufficient. That's when I think we're, we're missing the target on budget. But for the past four years, at least, <clears throat> we've been hitting or exceeding our 3% cap. And in my mind, that means we're able to take changes from last year, unexpected teacher hiring, for instance, that occurred over the year. And as we develop this year's budget, we already have them included. But we also are able to take any excess and use that to uh, pay down. Right. That's not the same as the contingency fund, right? right. Because you're authorized right. to expend the contingency right. fund during the budget year. Right. And the unexpended fund balance just sits there. You're not authorized to spend it yeah. unless you do something to that budget. That's right. But there was a town manager that didn't like yes. that principle. Right. He wanted the extra money right. allocated to each line item and not just a blank slush fund, if you will. Okay. Great. Um, and, the and, and I guess I just want to follow up. At, and, and the board understood that argument, and that's why they decided to go that way? They, they respected that argument, and so instead of saying we're just going to have an extra $1 million laying around, we said, okay, we're going to have an extra 50000 in transportation, we're going to have an extra 5000 in heating oil, and we put our contingency or our slush fund into each line item so that it was better budgeted. And that's true of personnel, too? Yes, There's it's true of all throughout the budget, yes. Okay. Now, I'll give you a contrast. When I was the superintendent in VC. VZ had a contingency line in their general budget, and they also had a contingency in their special ed budget. They had two, two contingency lines. You might want to examine that in the next one or two years as you be begin to formulate new budgets. And we don't always get it right, and that's when we see board-approved transfers from mm -hmm. one warrant article to another. Right. If it, and it can't exceed 5% transfer of any uh, warrant article, so. That's right, and the bottom line is summation is it's illegal to overspend the budget. Right. Well, it's illegal to set a budget for something other than your needs. Right. That's right. Yeah. All right. Policy committee. Uh, so we discussed a number of issues at the policy meeting. It's pretty much listed in the minutes. A couple of them uh, will be you know, put forward for second reading. Uh, one policy put forward for uh, first reading. We'll talk more about that. Um, we did look at... Uh, tweaking the um, superintendent evaluation guidelines uh, based upon the recommendations of the ad hoc committee um, to make things a little bit more smooth because you know there were certainly a lot of uh, comments uh, about making that better. Uh, we, you know, we're going to be talking, we talked about medical marijuana, talked about uh, medical marijuana policy, we'll be talking about that more next month or next week. Uh, and. Uh, talked about the uh, school volunteer regulation in terms of adding uh, child protective uh, investigations, um, substantiations uh, as part of the investigation in addition to criminal background checks. And I remember I owe everyone the um, updated superintendent evaluation corrections <laughs> that we talked about. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Uh, UTC. Yeah, the board met last night, and the, I guess there were just two major topics were the CTE funding, which uh, UTC has just lost money this year from what they had last year. The state is using some formula that it's not at all transparent. You don't know what they're doing. But you know, the soldier on what we have, and then the uh, they also talked about the Skills USA competition, which starts tomorrow. And the real activities are on Friday. If anybody has time and wanted to go to UTC to view some of them, you can. And they will be completed by noon. So you want to get there before the new time. But you know, I, I don't have a complete list, but I know there are a number of students from in the academy that are taking part in those competitions. So, Alan, if they lose funding, even a small 
portion of the funding. How is that going to, how do you see that affecting our students? I don't see it affecting our students at all. They've been very resourceful at working around those funding issues. And, um, well, they're doing like we do. They're dipping into their unexpended fund balance, or the board is approving that to get some of the money back. Plus, although the, the amount they were given as regular educational money dropped by 200 and some thousand, they were given an additional 200 and some odd thousand to start two new programs. Well, of course, so basically that gets them back to where they were, but trying to start two new programs with the same budget. What are the programs that cost? Uh, <laughs> you can tell us later. One of them is a medical program, medical assistance yeah, program, the MA program. Yep. And during the school vacation a week or two ago, the entire staff came in and rebuilt a room, the classrooms for that. It looks very nice. They tore out some old office space and built a whole new classroom for that part. And the second one, I don't remember if it's a business program or what it is, but there's two new programs that they're Great. I know we cannot get MA's medical assistance um, fast enough. Well, right um, now, a student in two years at uh, UTC can come out with their CNA, their CRMMA, their medical assistant, and I don't know, a couple of other things, all, all before they get out of high school. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Behavior Review Committee. Yep. Um, so we met on the 28th. I apologize for you not getting uh, the minutes in time for this meeting. Um, the agenda was preempted by a student behavioral concern, and uh, after quite a bit of discussion, a decision was made to contact the student's mother to discuss alternatives. Um, given the constraints on time at that point, um, the committee um, looked over revisions to policy JK and they were approved to be sent to the policy committee for consideration. A date was set for the dropout prevention committee meeting. Um, that'll be May 23rd. Nick Raymond is going to serve as the faculty member. Renee Light, a parent from uh, the Smith School, who will also have a student next year at the Wagner School, is going to be our parent member, Barbara Parent is going to be our community member. But we still need members um, for, to uh, represent teacher counselors, student, um, and if possible, an individual who actually dropped out. And so um, we'll be working on finding a way to maybe identify that person and see if they might be willing to join us on that committee. And our next meeting will be March 28th at 1.30, right here. Thank you. We still do not have an education foundation. Department. We do not. And it would be so cool if when Karen was gone, we, we got that vacancy filled. So does anyone want it? Are you nominated, Karen? There you go. Not here. Scott? Yeah. Is anyone interested in serving on the education foundation? I don't think they have a regular schedule, to tell you, to tell you the truth. Uh, Whenever you can get there, Tony, maybe this one maybe. Well, I'm, I'm not, not batting so great with the other two subcommittees I have. I was just curious. I'll try to find out. Peter Witt, last time, I, I haven't talked to Peter for a couple months. Last time I knew he was the, uh, the chair of the president of the foundation. I'll try to find out. I mean, I'll serve as a, a talking point between the board. I don't know. Right. Because yeah. a lot of meetings when they're during the day, I'm right. not yeah. booked so far off. Yeah. Well, let me see what I can tell you. I mean, that sounds like a volunteer to me, right? If we can get somebody that would go regularly, I mean, maybe one board member for a month, you only have to yeah. do two every they meet at night. Every year. Year. So, I'll see yeah. what I can find out. I'll bring that back yeah. next. Yeah. Uh, let's pencil yeah. Tony down. Tony down. Yeah. As long as it's not during the business day. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll follow up on that. Maybe I'll make those meetings since I can't get athletic or building. Um, Spruce Board has not met. We have a meeting on March 28th. Wellness Committee? I don't believe they've met, though. That could be wrong. Okay. Community Relations? We haven't met. No, we haven't. About six weeks. Right. 
Um, I would like to uh, share tonight that uh, Scott and I have talked, and due to a family situation, he's going to need to uh, move away from being chair. So we would be interested in seeking a new chair for community relations. <laughs> I feel like you watch. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is on that? Me and Les. Anyone else? Well, and you're already chair of ourselves. education, right? So I'll be dead. I'd volunteer for that. All right, good man. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next up um, policy considerations. So if you look at your uh, board packet, number or letter A is discuss and act on second reading and adoption of policy JIH questioning and searching, uh, searches of students and property. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Doing it. Do we need to talk about it at all? It's the same as it was before, no changes. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? <coughs> no? All in favor? Any um, opposed? Extensions? Okay, great. Moving on, discuss and act on second reading and adoption of policy EEAEF, student discipline on school buses. So, can you just say that again? <laughs> <laughs> Seconded. Uh, again, this is uh, the same as it was before, no changes. Okay. Um, all in favor? Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. And the last one, discuss and act on first reading of policy IJOA, field trips and other student travel. So move. Second. Uh, just to give you a little bit, this was, uh, the reason this came up was uh, we started taking a look at field trips after there was the drowning incident down in Southern Maine. Uh, and we worked off of a draft that uh, the Bangor School Department uh, had hired uh, an attorney to prepare for them, which was about 40 pages long, uh, give or take 10. But no, it was extraordinarily lengthy. Uh, we parsed it down quite a bit, uh, put more of the specific detail to allow the administration to put that into a regulation. And the reason why we didn't put in as much specificity, which this still does have quite a bit, um, is that we felt it was important not to be putting in um, standards that could then get us in trouble with the insurance company. And we can have had many conversations with the insurance company on how to make this flow through and, and work. So that's how we kind of came to uh, what we have now for the uh, policy, the proposed policy. Okay, does anyone have any questions? I, I do, and it may be that I'm not remembering correctly, but I thought somewhere in here we were going to put something about the school nurse being consulted. That was going to go in the regulation. Prior to? That, that goes in the regulation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Great. Okay, so that was first reading. Um, are we ready to take a vote? Yeah. All in favor? Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Great. Moving on. Uh, we have nothing under old business. No? Okay, good. On to move new business. Discuss the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act of 1974, 20 USC. Uh, uh, this, was a, this was a request for a board member. Uh, I've given you a lot of information on the act. Like any other particular law, there's a lot of definition, a lot of issues in there. So I guess basically it's probably a Q&A, if anything. Uh, people have. I was curious about the, um, what I didn't see in either of the two attachments was the um, reference to the um, <clears throat> business of video camera, um, footage being part of the educational record, if it's used for disciplinary purposes, and the rights of parents to view those um, records. Um, well, probably, getting back to Joe's point about 45 pages long, I'm giving you probably one-fifth of the law, so okay. it might be embedded somewhere else, Mary Ann. Yeah. Fortunately, I'm going to go back to the, probably say the same thing I said with respect to the report I gave tonight about the agencies. It's very rare you get into the, the depth and breadth of the, of, the, of, the, of the particular law. When I do, either I read the law and or consult with the attorney because every situation is entirely different based on the scope of the, of the issue at hand, if you will. 
But I think this is a pretty good guide. And the one thing I did want to accentuate, I think someone asked me this on the second page, schools may disclose uh, without consent of parents directly information. We do put on our forms that we have parents sign off on. If they want to not disclose, they do have that right or are given the right to uh, make that, uh, not to make that happen. So that was a point that someone asked me on. Mary Ann, uh, in regards to the school bus videos, uh, I did a little research, and I'm not, this is not a legal opinion, um, so I want that to be clear, but I did a little bit of legal research on it, um, and uh, one thing I noted uh, was that there was a seminar from a few years ago where that was a, a question that actually often was asked of school attorneys, and the, and the answer was, it depends, uh, because the Department of Education, federal, um, has not given clear guidance. Um, and, uh, but, so it, it used to be no, you, you couldn't be looking at these videos. Now it seems to be yes, you can if they're digitally altered, but they haven't really come out and completely said that. So it's a gray area. Mm -hmm. So I. I Some things you just don't have answers for. Until I think the bottom line in summation for me as your superintendent, if I get into a situation where it's not clear for me, that's where you call the attorney and sure. spend the $250 to make sure that you have the guidance to do it appropriately. Because yeah. malpractice insurance is a very good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <coughs> the reference that we were all sent was uh, is a fact sheet from the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. um, and they're quite clear that mm -hmm. if it's a record that was used, and if even if it can't be digitally altered, um, the parent still has the right to look at it. Um, now that's a fact sheet, and, but it is from you know, the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, so I'm curious whether we need to get clear ourselves um, in terms of, I, I went and looked on our website and we have the references, mm -hmm. but, um, and policy is pretty much saying that we follow the, the mm -hmm. law. Right. Um, is there any need for us to get any clearer? I would say no. I'm not an attorney either. And I say no quite confidently because the dimensions of this are vast. We could sit here and two minutes come up with 35 different themes, they would have 35 different answers, kind of like what Joe was saying, relevant to what's the question at hand, what's the theme? And that's where either you contact the uh, Department of Education, have their own attorney, or our school district attorney to guide us in that. Fortunately, uh, knock on wood, it's very rarely used with respect to trying to figure out the answer to the question being posed as it relates to FERPA. I just would. Matter of fact, do. excuse me, matter of fact, uh, Tony mentioned something a few minutes ago. We had a former board member that the board knows back quite a few months ago requested a vast amount of documents from the financial ledger. We had to consult our attorney to guide us on that, which we did. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce our new administrative assistant, the lady right at back, okay? Amber Peterson. Amber is going to be our new administrative assistant with Mr. Rue at Reedsbrook. And I believe she, Amber, you've already started, correct? I, I did officially start Tuesday, but I've been studying there for almost three weeks. Okay, so you will, you will see her at Reedsbrook every day, I'm sure. So congratulations, Amber. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is always a crowd favorite, the uh, school calendar. Okay, let me take this year first, okay? The current year that we're in, you can see my pen scratching, which I, I'm not very good with technology, but it works that works. So I would ask permission for you to allow me to adjust the calendar after I have affirmation for the administrative team next week as to how we're gonna make up that day. Let me give you my opinion with the, with the uh, option to change after next Tuesday, but I think we're gonna land on going the one hour a day for five consecutive days. So for example, if you look at April 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, if we go those five days and an hour longer every day, then we've met our obligation. So if you're okay with that, I'll make that decision with the administrative team next week and then notify our public well in advance when we're going to do that. And I think that's where we're going to land versus going to an April break or some so other option. All the students or just the seniors? All the students, because that's a good question though. So look at the calendar. If we do that, and if we have no more storm days, 
As I mentioned earlier tonight, the 17th becomes the 14th is the last student day for all kids. And then 170 will be in compliance with the June 9th graduation. So it'll be all pre-K through 12 students. So turn okay. an 80 minute period into a, what, a 95 or how does that work? Mr. Tracy, if we went an hour longer a day, what would be your vision as to the implication for Hanlon Academy? It would probably be a matter of shifting those same periods that are already existing in the afternoon, but I, I would need some time to prep that and decide with our team what would be best, for sure. Okay. okay. Any other is, questions? Is that target is the first week in April? No, I just use that as an example. But when we did, Mr. Lauer did bring up the point, which is a good one. We want to try to get ahead of the curve before sports, well, that's spring what I was sports. Thinking, yeah. So we'll once we decide next Tuesday, I'll let you know what uh, week we're landing on, what days we're landing on. Okay. Any other questions? That's only though if we have another school today. Right? No, that's where, that's where we are right now. Oh, we are out of, if you look at my hand scratch, you see 169 on June 7th. What are you looking at? Maybe I didn't give it to you. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I saw something. I'm cheating you then. I'll get, I'll get the draft the next year. Right. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I'll send it the extra around. Okay. So you can see that. <coughs> no, let me, let me, I, I should have given this to you. June 7th, which is a Friday, is our 169 day of school. We're one short for seniors. So we need to pick that up right there. Okay? So the long and short of it is we need to make up a day for seniors. And getting back to the question, we will do that for all students. We would adjust the calendar for all students. And once we define the days, I'll notify you folks and notify the community as to what those days are. Okay? I can't wait to take that from someone. <laughs> all right, so that's that. Well, I'll tell you, the kid, I had lunch at the high school yesterday. I had a number of kids come over to me and ask me, what are we going to do? What are we going to do, particularly the seniors? <laughs> I would have imagined the kid would rather do that. Yeah, well, what about Lucas? <laughs> what do you think? I was having a discussion yeah. with a few of my, my classmates today, actually last period, yeah. and they uh, tended to exhibit a greater interest in going another full day yeah. as opposed to an okay. extended day, just because that's a long time. Okay, but when would they want that day? Would it be on a Saturday or an April vacation or at the end of the year? And there was talk about replacing an in-service day with a school day, things like that. The only in-service day we have is this Friday. Right. And then, now remember, you need to make sure you capture that day before June 9th. Hmm. So you can't go, you can't tag it on the end of June. So you either have a Saturday, or an April, or this Friday. When I was listening to the options, I thought the April break seemed the, last, uh, the least intrusive, uh, in the student opinion, I would say. I'm, I agree with Lucas when he, when he said that yeah. As, as, you know, we're all chuckling because it's not, it's not you, you all sit there and they say, I want this, I want their parents this, or their, their yeah. vacation plans, yeah. it might be. Digital, digital snow days. Digital, digital snow days. Digital snow days. An extra hour for five days as a parent, an extra hour for five days can really mess up like the whole school year. Yeah. Yeah. And then the schedule, daycare schedule can really mess up a parent for five days. An extra hour. Really hard. Okay. Well, Saturday it is then. Just kidding. So, <laughs> and then, if, if you want, let's just spend a couple, a couple of minutes with the board. Give me, your, give me your basic sentiments. So let's go through it without any prioritization. A Saturday? No. no. An in-service day, which is this Friday? It's too no, soon. Too soon. Or April vacation? No. That's it? Because you have to do, we have to do that by June 7th. I think no matter what you decide, I thought of having that day. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, that's fine. There's one more, but it's not going to be Memorial Day. It's probably not even legal. I don't know. Okay. okay. So if you're okay with it, we'll decide as an administrative team, team Tuesday, and I'll notify you. All right. Okay. We'll all be equally disappointed. That's, okay. <laughs> That's all right. Now let's go to next year's calendar. I do have one adjustment. March 13 should be March 20. So it just flips that day from 13 to 20. Nothing else changes. So you can see here the advocacy from the administrative team is to start prior to Labor Day. The yeah. in-service day should be the 20th. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. I'm sorry, the 20th, right. not the 13th. And we build in three storm days, and I and I joke with people, you could build in 50 storm days if you want. The bottom line is when you get done in the year, you have to achieve 175 student days and 183 teacher days. That's it, irrespective of how many storm days you build in. So I would ask for your first reading on approval of the uh, first reading of the 1920 school calendar, and we'll bring a second reading back in April. So, quick so question. Yeah, Rob. Okay. No discussion. Yeah, first reading. So, so moved. Second. 
Okay. Discussion. So this year, the in service day was March 3rd, or it's Friday. This, mm -hmm. this Friday. Right. So March 3rd. Yeah. So does moving it to the 20th, given the weather patterns, allow maybe that time if we do need to make up a day? Well, that's a good question. Now, it's, Mary, it's not so close in the middle of the weather, but it, it's before yeah. June 7th. So Mary, explain why we're moving at the March 20th, please. Because Skills USA next year, oh. this year it's on the 8th, and next yeah. year it was originally on the 13th, yeah. and it got moved to the 20th. Yeah. So, that's so we why. have to be in compliance with UAT, UTC, Rob. Yeah. And as an example, this year on March 8th, we have a national speaker coming that costs many, many dollars um, through our Spruce Group. So. When we do in service, we really try to do things yes. that are meaningful. For the you might want to get back to Tony's point about the, uh, I'm not sure if you call it virtual, uh, the Candle Rock Court did this year. What do they call it? Digital, 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 digital virtual stuff. Yeah. So we might want to look at that as well. So this would be your first reading this evening of the 1920 school count. So we now, I would suggest, time. again, that I think we need to seriously look at moving this you know, to uh, after Labor Day. We're only talking a couple of days. I've sent an email to everyone with a copy of the Bangor school calendar for next year. Uh, Bangor has traditionally been doing after Labor Day. They did it this year, and they're, they're planning on doing it next year. And that calendar incorporates five snow days. Uh, and so, again, you know, I mean, we're looking at for the, for the, the older students, you know, the 10 through 12, because, you know, it's, it's a partial attendance. This, this proposed calendar is just a partial attendance uh, on the Thursday, the Friday would be, you know, the, the older students would be going just that one day. Mm -hmm. That does impact anybody who would be, you know, for example, working on, you know, down at MBI or something like that, you know, any kind of uh, job where they would want to be able to work through uh, Labor Day. As Tony and I have talked about, uh, you know, the last year, I think that uh, it does make an impact for families' uh, vacations and, and plans. But, you know, Bangor has been doing it. Bangor obviously has athletic teams. Uh, you know, they've been able to work around it. Um, this is calendar that, you know, they've got, you know, incorporates even more snow days. It's doable. That's their graduation. Do you know? I think it's a week later, but it's, it's in the it's email that I just sent you. Okay. Last I just year, was curious. we said we were going to reach out and look at including, you know, parent input. Yes. And I guess that didn't happen with the uh, principals, yeah. uh, Mrs. Briggs, did you, can you respond, to what, what, to what degree, if any, did you seek parent? I know we've obviously met with the union, but did you have any conveyance with parents? I have not had any discussion with parents as far as no one has come to me and asked for Okay. That, no, because no, we, we had talked about putting yeah. it out and actually have community relations yeah. send out an invite and... Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I will, so I'll say I, like, okay. I do remember that we always have a strong discussion around mm -hmm. this. <laughs> um, and as a parent, I, I, I agree, like it messes up your vacation, right? But I do remember very distinctly asking some of the teachers and the administrators in the right. audience as to the benefits to this type of schedule and um, hearing just really strong arguments about how this schedule and starting before Labor Day helps them to prepare and helps the kids to ease into the school year. And so they had some really strong um, arguments for academics and the academic benefits of it. So I just want to make sure that we are taking both things into account, not just the convenience of the parents' vacation schedule. Which I also like my vacation schedule to be convenient, but. Is, is that accurate though that the community uh, didn't send anything out? Because I distinctly remember, you know, uh, Scott, you know, really, I mean, everybody really kind of jumping on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be accurate, yes. We did not do that. We did not. Okay. Similar well, to how I did not send it. So we could do it. So we could do it. I mean, when's your next meeting? And, and rather than have it be a free for all of what do you think, just maybe option one, option two, option three. So We've done almost that. Almost voting. Oh, yeah. I would, if, if we do that, I would love to also hear from staff and administration too. Because um, again, I want to make sure that the staff and administration have um, the most influence. They are the experts in education, and I certainly want to hear their take on it. Um, Danielle had her hand up. Yeah, um, I teach at the high school, I teach AP class, so that extra little time is really beneficial because AP tests in early May, one is May 6th or 7th, and because um, all the schools in the south start in like
were going against like Florida and Texas, and they start in August and they're done school in May. You know, so we have to make that almost AP content in the le less time. So and you think the one day time. for the older students makes a difference? What you're talking about for your for your students, you're talking one day. Because well, they're because partial attendance. They come in on the Friday, right? That's correct. I mean, your AP students, that's like 11th and 12th grade, right? Uh, we, have, we have 10. We have 10 OK, 10. Well, but well, what you're looking at is the, and again, I understand there's so many different perspectives. But if you go Thursday with a partial day and Friday with a full day, you get rid of all of that beginning part of the year kickoff stuff that needs to be done, get everyone through their classes one time, meet their teachers, do all the paperwork, do all that stuff. So then when you come back Tuesday, you're right into academics, which is a, a huge benefit, I, I believe. So this is first reading. We will take it back to the Community Relations Committee, and um, I think perhaps the administration teachers could provide some way in as well. Um, again, this is always, always a crowd favorite, this topic. So, um, the, the key is we're celebrating, we're not suppressing it. We can have the facts, we can still make our decision, but at least we'll do it with informed yep. information. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. When does this have to be decided upon? Um, I'd like to do it in April, but certainly May would be the latest. Okay. Because, so because parents want to know now what's the calendar look like next year. Right. So April, April preferably. Okay. So Lucas and Sarah, can you do the same kind of um, survey or reach out to students about what they would prefer? Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. I'd love to hear from them. Don't ask the seniors. <laughs> <laughs> I know when the seniors are not going to yeah. have much interest. All right, this is a hot topic. So we have first reading, or we had, this is for first reading, we had a motion, we had a second. Any more discussion or questions? No? Can we have a vote? All in favor? First reading for this, let's get this calendar. Uh, anyone opposed? Abstentions? Great. Thank you. Great. Next up, discuss process associated with the Camden Academy gymnasium designation. We'll have Reagan and Mr. Lauer give that overview. So Reagan, if you would introduce it, please. In our district, we have naming policy for uh, any building or part of a campus that is going to be formally named. And we're bringing this before you tonight because we had had two prior discussions regarding um, the gym being nicknamed the stable. And uh, we decided to bring it back because although it is not a request to make a formal naming, we do recognize that there is a possibility that this name catches on that the students, staff, community starts to refer to the gym as the stable, and that it could in some way either um, support <coughs> that this name becomes a formalized name, or it also could potentially affect whether someone who would like to actually formally name the gym um, be either inclined or perhaps deterred from a formal naming. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, bring this up for a bit of discussion uh, to let you know that we have looked through all of the policy and regulation around naming. Uh, we do recognize that our athletic committee has discussed this on uh, two occasions um, at length. And we are interested in moving forward to just have a nickname that is posted on the wall. And I'll let Fred share anything in addition to this. But uh, we want to be sure you understand this is not an intention to formally name. It's not an advertisement of any sort. It's simply acknowledging something that seems to be becoming um, a reference point. We call it a nickname. We we'll call it a nickname. So Fred, do you and I would just add that this really came out of, it's been kind of like a grassroots. It just kind of started happening. And, it, and I would add that it has caught on. Uh, it's not that we're looking that it might catch on, it, it really has, and the media has caught a hold of this, and uh, it's re referred that way quite often. In saying that, is th 
Are there any questions around us moving to do this? Uh, any concerns that you may have? Uh, we wouldn't be seeking a formal vote or anything. We just really want to be sure that uh, the board has full disclosure of what our intention is. I'm trying to think of a downside. To what? Why would we formally call it? Because they want to sell the rights. Yeah. Well, I mean, you give you can always add that name, tack that on, you know, through another meeting. I mean, why can't we make it official? If if we have a formalized naming, we already have our ad hoc committee uh, established through the athletic committee, but we would need to move for formal naming to have uh, public participation in that decision. There are a number of groups that we would have to seek approval and uh, it's certainly something we could do I think at this time we we weren't thinking that there was uh, a necessity to do that I don't know if it's a necessity but I'm, I'm just trying to think why not why not but why is it needed, is it needed? Yeah, and of course there's a procedure I understand yeah. right. I think we could possibly maintain both if someone who was to name it mm -hmm. wanted to have naming rights at some point I think it would still be the stable Maybe right. such and such at mm -hmm. the stable. Or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I went, I went to UF and we had the swamp. So oh. the Ben Hope Rugby Stadium, and that was the swamp. <laughs> I'd like to ask um, Sarah and Lucas to just from your own um, where where you are. Um, I mean, does having I think I'm I'm thinking of terms of student ownership. So this is something that arose, I guess, out of uh, the student body. Um, so calling that space the stable versus John Q. Publix um, gymnasium, where are you on that? I think um, referring to it as the stable really kind of emphasizes the community of Hamden Academy and the students themselves having, you know, brought this kind of tradition up that's really become more prevalent in the past couple of years. Especially, at, I think it began with the hockey side of things. It's like the stable as in the hockey rink. But kind of, it's evolved into everything having to do with Hamden Academy, meaning the Hamden Academy athletics and the gym and things like that. So I've even heard students refer to the turf stadium as the stable. So it's kind of just, I think, general thing. Yeah. I think it really comes, I've heard it a lot with basketball games. Um, people come and they publicize the games and they tell the student body to pack the stable and um, to attend the games. And I think, yeah, really unite us. I think it's a good idea. So I think that would be the general consensus among all students. Thank you. Any other discussion? Are we saying it, we're really thinking it's a nickname, not a formal name, so it wouldn't require a change in policy that doesn't anticipate That's correct. that correct. Kind of That's correct. We will be coming back to you for a formal naming request once our ad hoc committee has worked through um, naming the turf, potentially, alumni field, and seeking um, donations for pavers to uh, bring our alumni back some form and encourage community participation and ownership in the space. So we will start that formalized process. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, la okay, next up is um, setting meeting dates. So I made a notation community relations <laughs> to set a meeting. So, <laughs> so that's uh, Chair Lester and Amanda. So Man, well, Regan, you're on the okay. team too, and Scott's not here. So what works? I mean, I'm pretty open. Mondays and Thursdays don't work well because I teach until quarter to seven in Augusta. Okay. Um, usually after, so after work would be my preference. Uh, what about? If we want to have a pretty quick turnaround to try to get a survey pulled together Wednesday the 13th. Um, I, have a, well, I have a 5 p.m. meeting for work on the 13th. Okay. Usually I don't. I could, so I could probably do like 
the late one, six or seven, six thirty or seven. What? Um, what about Tuesday the twelfth? I'm policy well. If it was at five, I could. I have, do a fin it. I have a finance committee. I was going to see if you're around at four, either of you, or is that too early for being after work? Uh, I could do maybe four twenty. I mean, it goes right up till four and things. Okay. okay. Um, how does that work for you, Lester? Uh, it too would early. It pos uh, no, that, that, day, uh, that day, unfortunately. Okay, the 11th? Um, I can do the 11th, but I think he said Mondays. So. Oh, yeah, that, I couldn't do the 11th. I could do, if we had to, the 18th, because it's our break. Um, I could do the 18th between 5 and 6.30. I have meetings on either side. Uh, I could probably do 5.30? I'd do 5.30. I'd have to leave at 6.15 to get to the next meeting, but that should work. Sounds do good. That? Okay. 5.30, And do we want to make that basically a one agenda, one agenda item? I think so. I think other than that, you have Ed Committee Finance, Policy, Behavior Review, Budget. What about Athletic Committee? Uh, we have one scheduled for the 27th for our uh, special board meeting. Oh, thank you. Yes, I see it. Yeah, okay, thank you. And the special board meeting the 27th. <coughs> All right. There you go. Any other meeting dates? No? Okay. Thank you. Which meeting are you down watching the Yankees? I am leaving the 13th, and I'll be back the 22nd. So I'll be down there for the 13th for the Red Sox. I have a, I have a spare Red Sox polar fleet in Give it a light. Yep. We'll have time to watch the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I will ask that someone read, uh, read the executive session. I uh, suggest or I request to be going to an executive session to discuss personal matter according with one MRSA subsection 4056A. Okay. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 So Mr. Holmes.